Good evening. It's, uh, this is my first opportunity to talk about Alan Watts in public. So let me back up, therefore, and give you a little bit of history. I was one of those people that came out of World War II. I was in the infantry for three years, went through Africa, Italy, France, Germany, Austria. And when I got out of the service, I tried a couple of colleges, but I didn't find them interesting. And uh, I pretty much gave up the idea of college until I met a young lady who said, there's one college you'll probably enjoy. I said, enjoy? And she said, yes, enjoy. And that was St. John's in Annapolis, Maryland, the 100 Great Book School. I said, well, I'll try it. So I went down, spent three days there, and looked the place over, and I said, good heavens, all they really do here is read 100 great books for four years. That's for me. And so I camped there, and I became the assistant bookstore manager and worked my way through St. John's. I was very much dissatisfied, bored might be better, at uh, going through the 100 great books. I didn't think they were too hot because I had a different goal. I was very much interested in philosophy. The kind of philosophy I was interested in, <clears throat> I was exposed to in 1948 or 47. And that was Nikola Landa's essence of Hinduism. And that just woke me up. And I said, there's such a thing as afterlife and soul and all of these things. I said, wow, first time I encountered them in any unified, meaningful whole. And so I continued at St. John somewhat haphazardly. And Joseph Campbell came out with his book called Hero with a Thousand Faces. And I sent him a note and I said, hey, I enjoyed your book immensely. Where is the great drama of myths going on? And where is it still going on? And where is something meaningful going on? And he dr dropped me a note and said, come on up and let's talk. So that became a relationship I had over the years with Joseph Campbell. Um, punctuated by separation of years, by the way, not an ongoing relationship. So in my last year, I went up to Joe and I said, Joe, look here. I said, where is philosophy going? It, it looks like it's all dead. And he said, Pierre, it is all dead. It's, it's, um, it's in the museums called universities. I said, wow. Could you recommend any? He said, no, but he said, there's something curious going on in San Francisco. San Francisco? He said, yeah. He said, a friend of mine, Alan Watts, is over there starting an American Academy for Asian Study using native speakers and native thinkers. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, there's a Hindu there who, what, who was a Hindu philosophy. There's a Chinese Taoist who is a Taoist. He's not writing books about Taoist. He is a Taoist. And so there's also going to be a Tibetan monk there from Tibet, studied in Tibet, worked in Tibet, lived in Tibet. Japanese, just lived there. And he's going to teach Tibetan philosophy. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. thank you, Joe. And got in my 1935 convertible LaSalle and made it to San Francisco after some hazardous trips here and there, which I won't tell you about. But I had a one-eyed dog, and he, ma he made it as well. So when I, got to, when I got to San Francisco, I got to San Francisco, did a couple of things, and uh, looked up Alan Watts, and uh, he said, yeah, he said, come on, join us. We've got a place going called American Academy up there in San Francisco, and I said, great. And so I got there and joined him and studied with him and had fun up there for many years, up until... Uh, probably 1960. 
And my career with Alan is itself uh, a, a kind of Doonesbury cartoon strip. And I'll give some evidence for it. Um, I came, as I said, into St. John's and I got very much interested in Plato and Plotinus and felt that the St. John's made a mistake in going on into Europe. They should have stayed there for four years. In any case, um, I continued that quest and I really enjoyed Alan Watts' great talks on lack of a doctor's suture. Uh, let me give you an example of the way in which he functioned in those days. It was a private house at 2030 Broadway up on the hill and there was a, uh, it's a private dwelling and it had four stories to it and his office was also the classroom, big fireplace and at that time there were very few students. I think the whole class only had 12 people. My class, by the way, in Tibetan philosophy with Lama Tata had an enormous number of students, uh, three, and one dropped. That's, that's how popular this was until the discovery of the two great pills. And so we used to go to this class and, and I caught on right away with a friend of mine, uh, Bill, I'll just call him Bill for the while, uh, psychologist, later became a psychologist. I said, Bill, you know, we got to work with this guy. He's quite, quite intuitive. And so we figured out a way to play. And that was, we would, all, we would start the classroom and we'd have coffee and sit around and Alan would start talking and he'd walk back and forth for a while with no particular point of departure and Bill and I would sit there and we'd try to pop questions to him. And it was like a fish, you know. The questions would hook him and he'd be hooked by the question and the question would hook him and then he'd proceed in a very intuitive way and go to great depth on these questions, especially those that dealt with, be, he was very much interested in Suzuki's Lankavatatra Sutra. And so that's the way we spent our time. But, um, I'd like to return to that idea of Doonesbury cartoon. One day, Alan came up to me and he said, Pierre, he said, um, I did a program. He had a weekly show at KPFA up there in San Francisco. And he said, I did a show and I decided to talk about you. I said, really? <laughs> That'd be an interesting show. He said, yeah. He said, I won't tell you what I said, but you'll hear it. I said, okay. So I turned on the ring and nothing happened. Next week, nothing happened. And I waited for maybe three or four weeks, and I went to Alan one day. I said, Alan, you mentioned a short while ago that you're going to talk about me on your show. He said, oh, yeah. He said, uh, but I have no control of when they do that at the station. I said, okay. Well, he did talk about me, the whole talk, and he never once mentioned my name. <laughs> so, I think that was in retaliation because I used to bug him. I once sent him a box with some matches, burnt matches in it, and with a little note, disguised handwriting, and I said, these were the matches that started the great fire, or a little tube of water, and this was part of the water during the great flood of Noah, right, and things like that. He never knew where it came from, at least for many years, and then someone told him. So in any way, we had this kind of relationship. My family and his family occasionally would go off together to uh, um, Mount Tampapalas, uh, Mount Tampapayas, and uh, have uh, a bottle of wine and lunch, you know, and sit over there in the trees and with his wife. I'll tell you a story about him. He's really a great guy. We were loading up the groceries. You know, his, his children were small, my children were small at the time. And uh, we went over there. And, uh, I think I only had one at that time. 
And he's walking by the tree and he says, see that tree? And he started talking spontaneously about that tree and the role it plays in Western European culture and mythology. He was like a walking Robert Graves and out came this outpouring. And his wife, who at that time was not uh, the wife he uh, was with later, uh, which is uh, Jano, his first wife went by and she said, oh yeah, yeah. I figured, you know, yeah, yeah. So she came back with a couple of bags and she said, oh, by the way, that's not a, it's a, <laughs> had the wrong tree. <laughs> But it was a great talk. Um, what, what is it that Alan Watts has done? I think Alan Watts is one of the, one of our century's great rhetoricians in the highest sense. He can go into the most profound writings and traditions and bring them to life. I think he has made more priests and priestesses, probably priestesses as well, than any other person in our culture. That is to say, if you master Alan Watts, who has some 40 books and lectures, he writes with such clarity, and he goes into the psychological dimensions of philosophical mysticism with such clarity, and can grasp the dynamics of it in such a way that if you memorize it, just memorize it, you can go to a party and pass yourself off as a girl. And many people have done it. It's, it's really quite interesting. That's the clarity the man has. Now, what has he done? He's taken the, he's very much, he, he did what Plato suggests you do with the great studies of the philosopher King. As you recall in Plato's Republic, when he talks about the uh, philosopher King, I'm gonna make sure I don't trip up on this. Um, he said it's necessary to understand the nature of arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, music, and bring them to, and harmony, I should say, into a unity. You have to take those studies and you have to see their, see each one of these studies, arithmetic, as Plato understands it, geometry, solid geometry, uh, astronomy, uh, harmony, you have to see each one of these and study each one of these in depth, but then he says, you know, unless you can see, and he uses two great words for it, he says, unless you can see the kinship and the community between these studies, he said, it'll do you a little consequence, little good, unless you see the kinship and community of all of those studies together. And if you can do that, that becomes the step into what he calls the law of the mind, which is the more profound part of Plato, which is then expressed in what is called the dialectic. Alan Watts has taken, instead of the studies of Plato, he's taken Buddhism, he's taken Hinduism, he's taken Chinese philosophy, especially uh, Taoism, Zhuangzi, people of that nature. He's taken Carl Jung. He's taken his own tradition, which is a Christian tradition. He was a priest. And he also takes a couple of very interesting modern thinkers, among whom I recommend quite a bit, Nicholas Berdyaev. He was very much interested in Nicholas Berdyaev. And when he and I would talk, about thinkers, we would often talk about Nicholas Berdyaev. Uh, his writings are, are just quite, quite and profound. You know, he goes into the heart of the dynamics of the highest kind of metaphysics and philosophy. And so what Alan was able to do, you see, is he was able to study each one of these and go in considerable depth and then, see, he connected them. He connected them, and then he showed their kinship. He then expressed it in such a way, which was his manner, which was so clear, and added to it a whole dimension of philosophical humor and psychology, that he brought it alive, and he then shared it with us all. So I think he's one of the great 
uh, great geniuses. And in that sense, I speak of him as a great rhetorician. He mastered the art of communicating. He could do it effectively. And what I'd like to do this evening is to kind of go through what I think is one of his great works. Uh, I, we, we often referred to it in those days, and that's the supreme identity. That he did that in 1950. Now, I want to help you see something about Alan. Um, this was during the time we were at the Academy. All right. Now, that's the Academy of Asian Studies. When we were there, you see, you could go downstairs and have coffee with Ji Ming Shen. Ji Ming Shen was a Taoist. He was a Taoist. His family was a Taoist. He had written several interesting articles, but he was himself a Taoist. The Hindu there was Haridas Chaudhary, the author of many books after this, and also the founder of the school in San Francisco, the comparative uh, school, what do they call it now? Uh, pardon me? Integral studies. Integral studies, yeah, yeah, quite thank you, yeah. And that was Dr. Chaudhary at the time. And, uh, and uh, for Buddhism, we had Princess Poon, who was a Theravada Buddhist. She, was, she de developed her whole skill as a, as a, she was one of, the, one of the masters of Buddhism. So, and of course there was Ram Landau at the same time who went into Islamic thought, which was later a problem. But in any case, you see, well, there was a, there was a problem at the time, but I'll skip that for the moment. Okay, now look here. You see, we could go downstairs having a cup of coffee if there was some issue about philosophy or comparative philosophy and talk to the people who were living it. They didn't have to open up a book and convince us. They could speak out of their own experience. And therefore, it was a very rich, very rich time. So that Alan, you see, could then, he was in the center of this, see? And he moved with freedom, and he was greatly respected by these people, and therefore he could absorb the richness of these many traditions. And uh, and there, you see, there's a tension in studying these because people naturally become identified with one, and they reject another. And so loyalties are formed and abandoned as you pass from one to the other. But Alan Watts was able to maintain an integrity about them all. And I always admired that because I wasn't that way. I became totally devoted to Hinduism for a while and then I jumped into Buddhism and then I jumped into Chinese thought and <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't the way he was. He, he was very fair and just in his... Uh, he was quite, uh, quite developed at that point, you know. So, he, he focused really on one issue, and I think it's the central issue that goes through all of his writings, and that's the way of realization. Now, here there's a problem, you see, with the idea of realization, the way of realization. He was able to draw from all of these traditions a method of grasping the unity of all of these things in respect to how to realize the nature of the Supreme, how to realize the nature of the Atman, the Tao, uh, Satori. He was, able to, he was able to understand those things. He brought them together. But just let me anticipate where we're going. Let me, let me jump so you can, you can see it. Because you know the kinship and community of it, Will it follow that there might yet be something missing? Yes. If the model is, because I'm introducing this model of Plato, if Alan Watts stands to these as the art stand to the philosopher king, and as it's necessary for the philosopher king to find the kinship and community of all of the studies in order to prepare himself for the dialectic, so too, perhaps, we have to master all of these and find their kinship in order to go on and do something that completes them, because it may not be complete. <coughs> uh, 
And that's what I'm going to, that's where we're going. So, what is the way of realization? Again, I think the uh, volume that we chose for tonight is a real good one. Uh, it has a nice history to it. Uh, so, I just sketched it out for you in order to show you the drama of what's going on. Now, hope you can read my handwriting. In any case, I'll talk about it. You see, Alan proceeds with a dialectic. He always proceeds in a certain way. And if you catch on the way he proceeds, then you can follow his thought and you can anticipate it. And it's a very fine development. He starts off by creating the problem. I've always enjoyed that. He creates the problem before you go into it. So he starts with the work called the way of realization, which, by the way, I brought my old copy, anyhow. Okay. Okay, the supreme identity, Alan Watts, I got a paperback of it. That's when they were still a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> kind of yellowed out and all that, but. So the last chapter is the way of realization. He starts, therefore, by generating a problem. And certainly that is one. So he says, look here, we start out with this quest, how can I attain ultimate reality? And he'll go into it and he'll build it. That's our goal. This is what we all want to see. Now he's going to focus on this. Can the eye attain ultimate reality? This looker. Impossible. Because now he's going to say what we mean by the eye is the ego. And the ego is incapable of grasping the nature of the self or the supreme because the ego itself is a restriction of consciousness. It's a restriction. And since it's an inherent restriction that allows us to function with images, it of necessity has an internal re remoteness to it. It is itself. It has a remoteness from the divine. The ego always has a sense of remoteness and separation from the self. And therefore, the ego wants freedom, but yet is itself is incapable of achieving it. And therefore, how can I attain ultimate reality? I can't. Because the I is a myth. Or it functions in a certain way, but it doesn't have the substantive nature to engage in the nature of reality. The ego is a construction. He says, well, therefore, what shall you do if you're stuck this way, if the ego can't work out? Well, he comes from a very rich Anglican background, and he then explores the concept of grace. Well, then you need help. In some way, in order to gain something in your spiritual life, you can't allow the ego with all of its uh, tendencies to try to fashion its own way to the supreme. You need help from the self. The self isn't dumb. That's the idea of grace. He shifts then, and he talks about Krishnamurti. And now he then explores Krishnamurti, Hindu. And he really understands Krishnamurti. And a lot of people don't. Of course, I shouldn't say that maybe many people do, but I don't think many people do. Because Alan Watts was able to grasp all of his writings and be able to say, look, I can tell you what Krishnamurti is saying. He's saying the basic drive for spiritual freedom in man is not for the supreme itself, but to satisfy something, and that's the desire for security. That's what we're doing. We are insecure. We are remote. We have a strangeness. We experience that. The I itself, the ego, is a fixed form and it desires security. It's insecure intrinsically. Well then, Krishnamurti, according to Alan, he said, there, there is one way out of this. Grasp, grasp that insecurity. Make that the object of your attention. Become vividly aware of your own state, your own miserable state. Right? Right? Become, oh, you're insecure, you want the divine? Okay. 
forget about prayers for a moment, forget about yoga for a moment, focus upon the desire itself. See, focus on the desire itself, not the object. Focus on the desire, your desire for it. Because that desire is the problem. Well then, what's the solution? He says, well, what you must do is become vividly aware of that process that's going out. See? Here we are, right? We're now in a pursuit. Here's the supreme. We're after it. Ah, we're after it. Maybe I can even make this better. We're after it. We want to grasp it. We want to grasp it. Oh, good. Uh, Alan now goes through a, now one of the great, one, 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 I think one of the great uh, strengths of Alan is that he can move into the dimension of psychology so easily and he can express it with clarity because now he's going to write about this, this desire, you see, this, this, our desire to reach the supreme. That's what he's going to talk about that in psychological language, he's going to describe it. And he said, look here, so long as that desire springs from an egoistic motive, gee, I want to get it, I want to become this, I want to become that, I want to have the power, I want to have the fame, any egoistic motive blocks the very pursuit. He says, oh, wait a minute, you know what you can do? Continually focus on this. Continually focus on this. If there's a motive to your spiritual desire, by focusing on the desire, you will then become more knowledgeable of the motive. Let this be your goal, not this. Of course, you're interested in the supreme. Focus on this. Focus on this. He says, that's the beginning of the spiritual path. That's the beginning of the way of realization. Why? He said, because then you're going to go through a process of separating by necessity you're going to now be able to focus on, you're going to focus on the ego and its function. Oh, oh, the very process of doing that is going to awaken, that process is going to awaken a separation. Ah, and now you're in the real struggle and now you begin to understand a bit the relationship between the self and the ego. Because as you're watching it, what is it that watches it? There has to be something else going on. Ah, that insight for Alan is, that's the beginning of the spiritual path, the way of realization. So, you know what you're saying? Know it, know this process, know this process. By the way, you'll never be, you'll never be successful. Great, it doesn't matter, why? Because by focusing on the process itself, you're then separating yourself from the ego, or at least becoming aware of its functional presence. So therefore, there's a shift in consciousness he talks about. Oh. Then, when, once he then gets the problem clear, he now shifts and shifts it through each one of these. Once he gets the problem clearer, he's now going to go through this. This is somewhat like the circle of fifths in music. Or, you know, Mendeley of Table of Elements. He's going to just spin through these. Or the primary colors. He's going to work himself through these colors to compose something. So the first thing he takes is he redefines it in terms of the Hindu idea of moksha, right? Liberation. How can I as the self attain to it? How, there's it? how can I as self, as the self, attain to it? All right, so the ego can't. All right, then how can I as self attain to it? So he redefines it and says, okay, now that I know this, I'm still interested in the supreme, I'm still interested in this realization, how can I manage it? Okay, I'm beginning to see the ego can't do it. Okay, now what can I do? Now I got that. Oh, good, I got that in my back pocket. He says, good. Now, I says, well, you know, what you're really trying to do is make the self 
pursue the object of the sub wait a minute, there's no difference between these two. There's no difference between these. It's trying to make the self and the object of its search. How can you do that? How can you how can you use the self to try to to try to grasp the self? This doesn't make any sense. I and mean, what do you want to do that for? If you have one, then Alan often turns to humor at this point, and it often takes the form of uh, you know, how come we're so stupid if we're so smart? I mean, how can we be, how can we be so ignorant if we have this wise self? And now he'll play with that on many levels and try humor on it. So now he'll move from Hinduism to Chinese. He went to uh, Siyong, and uh, he says the basic problem, now he picks up the Chinese thought at this point, uh, Siyun, and he says, you know, the, the real problem is the failure to understand that the mind and the object of his search are one. These are both the same. These are the one. These are the one. It's a failure. <coughs> now he leads us as readers to see this. He's now moving into, went into Hinduism, goes into Chinese thought. He's going to spend some time there. And he says, this heightens the tension, the separation. But yet we need to do something. We feel we need to do something. Now then he turns and he says, you know, the real, the real insight of Chinese philosophy, Taoism, is that uh, there is a need to do something. The self must will to do something. But uh, there's nothing it has to do. It already is. It doesn't have to do anything. Ah, he shifts at this point in the text, and he then talks about St. Teresa. He can move, now he moves into, I should have another circle here, right? Christianity, Berdyaev. Uh, he has some other thinkers, but in any case, he moves into St. Teresa and says, look here, how do we avoid this dismal conclusion? Do we just sit and do nothing? Just sit and wait for enlightenment, since we can't do anything? Just sit and wait? Because if you, anything you do is mistaken. He says, now look here. But whether you act or you don't act is independent. It doesn't make any sense because you can sit there. Many people sit and do nothing, and, and that's the way they remain. Some people act, and then they still act, but it depends what they bring with their act. If they bring with their act their own uh, motive power from the ego, it's going to be ineffective. So what's the solution? So Alan shifts and says the big key word through all of this is what he calls the presence. Right, the presence. If the self, what is the self? It's here, and yet it is infinite. Imminent, transcendent. Imminent, transcendent. Now, how are you going to use that insight in your way of realization? Well, whatever you will, look here, whatever you will, all right, let's take the action now. What is it that is acting and what is watching the action? Look, we got a dualism here. What is watching and what's doing the action? Okay, I got the watcher, I'm watching. I'm watching my hand, what's doing the hand? Hey, <laughs> what's moving the hand? <laughs> okay, I got a watcher, right, he's watching. Hey, hey hi, what's moving you? <laughs> hmm, <laughs> curious. <laughs> what turned the hand? I don't know. <laughs> so you're, you're stuck, you're stuck, your thinking is blocked. The language you use can't fit your predicament. He says, you know, the solution to this is to recognize that one's present knowledge is nothing other, see, when you act, it's nothing other than the self itself wills. The self wills and the self watches. They're one. Oh. You know, I may be a little more comfortable with the idea that I'm watching because I'm not sure how I move that hand. 
Actually, I'm more familiar with a watching role than I am in willing. There are many things I will that are so fast. Look here, I just moved that hand. How did I do that? Why did I do it then? Have I calculated all of this? No. Well, then what's going through you? Well, it's the self. Let the self exist. Let it function as it will. You watch, but you're also the doer. Ah, that sounds good, but that's rather curious. Well, good thing we have another page. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, moves to Taoism. So you can only that far with China. Now he goes to move to Taoism, and he's now going to uh, push the process of uh, the process of realization. He says, "Look here, there is. It's right. No discipline. No discipline because you can't do anything. Well, therefore, you know what you can do. You still, you still want this." still want those, or there is still a desire for them. What kind of a desire? Love. Behind it all is a fundamental love towards the Supreme that all men share. Alan now moves into that thesis, and it's a very profound one. He handles it very well. And he says, the basic interest we have in trying to reach realization is motivated by a love. We have a love for the mystery of life. We really do. We are all involved in it. Now, what does that mean? That means human life is ordered and directed towards realization. This is a quote from Alan Watts. Human life is ordered and directed towards realization as its proper end. All human life is has that as its goal. Everything you're doing is moving towards that direction. It's you just got to wake up to it. The ego itself can do nothing. God performs in and through us. And there is no us. This takes on the form of, uh, uh, in Europe there's a extreme form of romanticism that picks up this theme and Alan was uh, influenced by that as well. All right. Now look here then. How then should we proceed? Now Alan now is going to move from here. He's now going to go into yoga. And now he's going to go into yoga. He's well he says, you know what, let's review the process of yoga. As you know, there are three stages that come together uh, called the samyama, uh, the studies taken together as samyama. And um, it starts with concentration. You have to have an object of concentration. Let's use what we're doing as the object of concentration. To the degree that you love this, to the degree that you recognize you're being motivated by a selfless love, right? to the degree then that you're your desire is for the object, and you're willing now to focus your attention upon the very activity and watching and studying yourself in the very act of love. What does that do? He says, well, you know, he says, yoga is just one thing. The first stage of yoga is concentration. And that means that slowly all the other things that interest you <coughs> lose their significance until this becomes the natural goal of your reflection and concentration. It's a natural goal. Natural goal means excludes all else. Now he'll move to the idea of om and says, look here, if you focus even on the word om, right, om very exclusively, on and on and on, you will then have that as the sole occupant on the mind, so what? Ah, no ego. That's it, no ego. Ah, no ego, so long as you have this object. Says, well, then you have to go into the next step, which is meditation. Alan's idea of meditation is extremely interesting. Uh, uh, what it is, is to uh, the process from attention, right? You have the object focus, you're not going to, you are possessed by the question, the question has you. Uh, the object of your mind, the mind has, and you're the witness of it. 
at this point, he talks about relaxation. Now he goes psychological, you see. And he says, the thing is, you must learn to relax more into it. Relax, relax. That's the whole process of the higher step of meditation. So that, therefore, not only you're holding the object in the mind, right, but you're naturally identifying with it. And he says, from this point on, there's a danger. There's a danger. And that is, it's difficult to continue the process and remain in society. It really takes a separation from society, go to a monastery, go to a, a retreat and practice this. He says, because obviously, if your mind is trained for this and you're driving down the road thinking of Om, they'll find your car wrapped around a tree. So, now he said, look here, and how do you, if you can't, all right, if yoga is out, no exit, after all, you have to exit from society. Is there any way to do it? Ah, now he goes back to Chinese thought. So he's creating, creating the problem He's bringing us along with it, using each one of these pieces so that he can illuminate the subject. And then he goes to uh, Chinese thought. And he goes to the Chinese notion of wuxin, which is, hey, the whole practice of spirituality and, reali and the process of realization is you don't interfere with what's going on, you don't identify with it. Then Alan then quotes several Chinese thinkers, among whom, of course, uh, Zhuangzi is one of his great favorites. And I think he's a major thinker. And he uses the, uh, the, one of the central notions of Wang uh, Chuang Tzu by saying, uh, the mind's like a mirror, see? It grasps nothing, it refuses nothing. That's the way you should be in this practice. That's all. Grasp nothing, refuse nothing. Watch it take place. The watcher then becomes distinct from the stream of events at this point, right? You're now focusing more on the watcher. Ah, that's the way. That's the Tao. Ah, ah. Then you are, <clears throat> then what is it that you are? You are, you are, you are whatever you are. You are exactly what you will. What you will, you experience. What you will, what you will, you experience. That's what you are. That's all. That's Chinese thought. You are exactly what you will. You have just those experiences that you will. That's what you have to then have a clear perception of. If you have a clear perception of that, he said, that's the way to realization, and now you're moving into realization itself. To have a clear perception of limitations of the ego then awakens your, your uh, realization of the self. But really, to stay on this point, right, that you're exactly what you will. The you that wills and the watcher that watches what is being willed are identical. So that whatever you are, if you're suffering, suffer. If you're in pain, you're in pain. You got yourself in that kind of situation. Okay. Now be there. <laughs> you know, you lived a life such as that's where you are. Okay. That's where you are. Might as well take a look at it. Might as well. Might as well because there isn't any alternative. <laughs> yeah, that it's true. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> well, he then comes to a conclusion, you see. He says, this is Brahma. Therefore, all events, this is an event, whatever you will, you experience. You know what that is? That's one moment in an eternity. That's one moment in an eternity. And that eternity is the, uh, the, what he calls the creative process unfolding. Um, Plato, of course, has a way of describing it, I think in equal terms. He calls that... Um, Time is a moving image of eternity. And uh, what, on, what flows, the outflowing of time, is nothing but an image of eternity. Eternity, therefore, is a simultaneous whole. So, 
Therefore, Brahman is to be able to view all events in one moment of eternity. As, uh, you know, William Blake said, you know, to see, was it, to see the world, to see the world in a grain of sand and hold heaven in the palm of your hand. What is it? To hold infinity in the palm of your hand and in eternity in an hour. Yeah. yeah. Ah, so, all we really have, therefore, is present experience. We only have the present. Now, what do you do with memory and anticipation? From the ego. He says, hey, you know what? Accept that. Accept that. Yep, yep, that's memory. That's your memory. That's your anticipation. Don't be at war with it. That's you. That's what you got going for you. This is what you created. Or this is what was created. And you can realize that that's what it is. That's the nature of the self unfolding. Well, <clears throat> therefore, Zen and everyday thoughts is nothing other than the usual way of the Tao. When one finds oneself able to will and consciously accept the precise point at which one stands in the cycle of life, that is realization. This is a quote from Alan. Therefore, the process of realization is the same as the process of creation and its manifestation. Therefore, his conclusion, our willingness to be insecure, to suffer, to be finite, to be a slave, is to be truly free. So therefore, he, end, he discloses all of this. He creates it. He starts with a paradox and gives us, in the end, a bigger one, and we enjoy the ride. And somehow, through the way, he, he benefits us all. Now, let me now go back to the issue we started with. <clears throat> When one finds oneself able to will and consciously accept the precise point at which one stands on the cycle of life, that is realization. Right? That comes out of the supreme identity. Now, let's see if we can return to the problem. Uh, you're enlightened, why don't you wake up to the fact that you not only are enlightened, but you're exactly where you should be, and that's the unfoldment of the divine in the moment. No matter where you go, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> and there's enough room for you, so you might as well enjoy it. So, uh, yeah. Kevin, is your problem that he says that if you just be a slave, that you can free that one? I don't know what that problem is. Well, why did you ask for the last line? Because that's what well, I said I was, the last I, line. I was asking for the conclusion, but I, he told that me. That was the conclusion. Yeah, he told me. So, okay. Okay. Well, there was uh, a paraphrasing, maybe. Yeah. yeah. I think so. well, I'm glad you came to an agreement. Let me return to the basic problem we started with. All right. Remember what we said. We said, I'm setting this up as a model. That in Plato, there is the... the studies leading to the philosopher king. Each of these studies, you must see the kinship and community between them. That's what Alan has done. But this is a prerequisite in Plato for the dialectic. Now, what I find most interesting with Alan, and we've had talks about this uh, several times. Matter of fact, it was the major talk we had for many, many years. Um, if one takes up any book of Alan's like this one, which I haven't done, but I'll, I'm sure it's true, and I look at the index, uh, it will always lack several people, Plato, Plotinus, Proclus, Dionysius. Too bad. Yeah, that's right. No, 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 wait a while, wait a while. Alan Watts did a very fine translation of one of the works of Pseudo Dionysius. He knew it. His Greek is very good. All right, I advise you to take a look at it. The problem is 
that there's no place in the structure for the Hellenic tradition. That's the problem, you see, because the Hellenic tradition ends up with this. Now, how can we make that more real for you? What is it that the dialectic would bring? It would say, since you can be, or you are, any one of these things, <clears throat> slave, master, king, fool, my Uncle Louis, This is where the dialectic comes in in Plato. Plato would say, yes, it's quite true. It's quite true that the divine in some way, mysterious as it is and profound as it is, works through one and all. Certainly that's true. And the whole course of this is nothing but the unfolding of the divine through uh, everyday world. Oh, he would say, yes, quite true. But then he would go to one step further and say, But aren't some of these better than others? Here's the difference, you see. Better. Are there not some of these places better than others? Let's even make it more significant and say, the philosopher. For Alan, there's a relativity in spirituality. And it's at this I have often taken exception to. And um, you see, you, with the conclusion to this work is that you simply accept where you are. There's a kind, he says, be careful, don't take my words to reflect a stoicism. It's not a stoicism. He wants to dignify it, and dignify it as much as you can. The issue still is, since the divine unfolds in a variety of ways, is it not possible that in that variety of ways in which it unfolds, that are some offer a better vantage point than others, both, both for yourself and for your vision? and for knowing the very thing that's flowing through you. That's the dialectic, you see, for one reason. The dialectic starts with this one premise, and that is, as you proceed towards something that's most meaningful to you, wherever you are blocked, don't accept that as your fate, but try to discover why you're blocked. Make this your proper object of meditation and reflection. So you can then find a way to go through these, because every place you're blocked, Plato will say, is ignorance. You are caught in a belief web. Pardon me? How can it go around ignorance and belief? Well, it goes through it in this way. The whole goal of the dialect is to discover, first of all, that it is a belief. And it is a belief that you do not know because the person usually justifies where they stand. And therefore, you have to discover why the person, on, on what justification they accept where they are and defend it or feel miserable about it, same thing. And find out how that idea came into existence for them individually, who their teachers were, what influenced it so that they can see it's arbitrary. It's not necessarily a part of their own being. And if you can see something that you took to be true to discover that it's really a belief you didn't know that you held, and to recognize that you don't have any basis for holding that belief, then you have to accept the fact that you're ignorant about the thing that's been motivating you and identifying you with your role. That dissipates the power of the belief. 
That doesn't mean you get your goal, by the way. You may now face another one and another one. That progress is called the dialectic. Pardon me? The first step of wisdom is acknowledging your own interest. Yes, that's where this is. That's quite true. That's what this is all about. And also, the there's been lots called the supreme, Plato called it the good. There's that's true. That's true. Yes, there's another difference that's important, and I'm glad you brought that up. In the Platonic tradition, it's very much like Zen in one respect. In Zen, they have the ten ox herding pictures where they have eight stages of enlightenment or realization. This idea of stages is not made clear in Alan's thinking. He doesn't distinguish this. By the way, the Japanese make the distinctions, but they don't build it into their thinking, their theoretical thought. Plato takes the significance of these distinctions and these steps and tries to discover how you can understand it as an intellectual system. Or to put it another way, he tries to show that this is intelligible. That this is intelligible. Each of these stages is intelligible of enlightenment. And therefore, he builds a theoretical structure which then brings reason and understanding into it, so therefore we can understand the very processes of our realization and make it part of a larger intellectual grasp of reality. And that's the difference, of course, between. And, uh, so uh, I, I would say that for myself, I uh, was very fortunate in being able to work with Alan and be with Alan, and I'm very glad that he accepted me as a, as a friend. And uh, my relationships with him throughout the years was uh, notable, fun, surprising, and if I had time, I might tell you a couple of other stories, but it would, might take more time than we have. So I'd rather hold it here and ask you for questions. Anything I can do to help you with any of this, please ask away. Please. Well, what would the goal, in, the, in Plato's dialectic, what would the goal be defined as? The highest good, which is the good, like the, the which is the supreme. The, mm -hmm. the supreme. Um, there are two goals. One is called the idea of the good, which is uh, the uh, the most brilliant light of being, a state of luminous luminosity. Uh, and then beyond that is the good itself. So there are two. What dialogue were you referring to when you were saying that? Well, I can't hear you. Louder, what please? dialogue were you referring to when you were talking about the steps? stages that he outlines makes intelligence. Well, the clearest expression of this is in Plato's Phaedrus. And one of the most brilliant essayists who unpacked that was Proclus. Proclus did that. He showed how each one is a particular stage in the development. And then you can take very, the various dialogues and see that. The symposium leads to the luminous uh, numinous luminosity or radiance and the Republic leads from that to the idea of the good um, <clears throat> but the heart of, of this breakdown is the Phaedrus yeah, that, that reminds me of the, the Phaedrus yeah good <laughs> talks good. about the influence of the beauty forming in the eyes yeah yeah, yeah. It's like a third chakra experience could be, could be, could be, could be, yeah. I'm so curious, uh, because before I came here tonight, I picked up Alan Watts' autobiography and looked you up in there. Yeah, yeah, I'm and, in there. Uh, yeah. I, uh, he said some very interesting things. Yeah. One of which is that he saw you as a man of singular compassion and humor. Yeah, that's yeah. What, that's uh -huh. what he said, I really want to come to hear well, you, and, I, and you've worn that up. I'll tell you what happened. Yeah. When I was in Sausalito, just when that book was, uh, a couple of months before the book was published, I was in Sausalito with my daughter, and uh, we met Alan coming out of the bookstore, and we had a cup of coffee and had some fun. And uh, he said, oh, by the way, Pierre, he said, uh, I'm writing my autobiography. Well, I said, oh, you're going to drop dead soon? <laughs> 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 well, you know, I mean, 
autobiography? You know, why do you write an autobiography unless you think you're going to drop down? I, I didn't mean that to be funny. In any case, um, he said, well, he said, I know what you're thinking. He said, I put you in. I said, I know what you're thinking. I said, I won't ask. So when the book came out, my name was in it. <laughs> so to bring the beginning of the story in with the end. And um, yeah, he... Um, he talked about your, he, he said it was a metaphysical encounter for you, so-called. He said where you, he said you graduated from Plato's and Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna. And that you learned to have a kind of metaphysical encounter group where you would elicit the deepest assumptions of people, whether yeah. it was logical positivism or Hegelianism or yeah. whatever it was, true, true. and show that these were merely arbitrary axiom, uh, starting points, and that they weren't truth, and that yeah. would make people anxious, and then you would have people see, well, what's the premise underlying the anxiety? Right. And right. that you would kind of lead them to a kind of uh, more relaxed kind of space. And I, I yeah. wanted to put that out there and see if you had any memories or clarifications. Yes, well, or I'll tell you the story about it. There's a story about it. Yeah. There's a story about it. <laughs> great. Um, well, we had to do papers, and so, um, he said, someone should really do a job on the Gestalt psychology. I said, oh, I'm not doing a job on psychology. So I did a paper on Gestalt psychology. And um, um, he said, you have to read it and defend it and round this 12 group, this small group of graduate students. And I enjoyed it. And when it was over, he said, Pierre, <clears throat> you're now working here. You're now a lecturer in comparative philosophy. And I said, good. He said, yeah, you can you just, you know, just do comparative philosophy. I said, oh, okay. So we used to have my class in, this, in the basement of this four-story building. We had classrooms down there in a coffee shop. And Alan would come in, he'd sit in the back, and he'd go, oh, no. And he'd walk out. <laughs> and that's what we used to do. That's, that was the course that we uh, engaged in. And, uh, we were very close. Kind of had an affinity there. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, he was a very... Uh, uh, before he died, he asked me to go on a world tour with him where I'd be doing the dialectic and he'd be doing the lecturing or the dialoguing. And uh, uh, I, I didn't think it would work, by the way, you know, <laughs> because I'm not very good on the stage. But uh, it didn't take off for whatever reasons. I think the biggest reason it didn't take off is that he died. You know, it's very difficult to do it when you're dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ron Hubbard, yeah. yeah. I uh, was one of the people, there are many of us, by the way. I don't mean to be the, signify I'm the only person, but uh, I met Ron in Washington, D.C., but just the first time his uh, Dianetics was featured in, in the uh, science fiction magazine and ran over there and had talks with him. And uh, I figured this is, this is good, but it's not... It's not what I want to live with. And uh, so Alan was interested in Ron Hubbard and uh, for, for a short while. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm interested in the role that the, you use the word rhetorician with respect to Alan. Does that mean that there was something that he wasn't seeing? I mean, I guess you, you oh, could have. There's a popular sense of rhetoric, which is low. But in Plato's <clears throat> Phaedrus, he talks about it rising to the level of an art. Okay. And when it rises to the level of the art in the Phaedrus, of course, then the man's words and understanding should be able to grasp the nature of the soul and be able to match the words for the person's soul. And I think what Alan did was he understood America and Americans. He understood that great intellectual tradition he came out of. And he was able to grasp that and talk about it in such terms that he could communicate to our age. So that higher it's sense of amazing, amazing. About the soul. Yeah, about, and also the intellectual tradition. He, he's a very, very, uh, very profound thinker, probably the most insightful person I've ever known. Just wind him up and let him go. <coughs> and, uh, um, um, 
what can I say? Um, um, he he lived long enough to have a lot of enemies, so that he must have been pretty <laughs> must have been pretty good. As was wise people. Yeah, are like the people that are part of uh, Zen Buddhist traditions sort of prejudiced against him? I mean, I've heard some masters. Why, of course. Uh, of course. Of course. Why, how do you account for that? Well, he was right. Um, <laughs> no, no, he, he was right. I think he was right. Which um, one? one day um, at that school, um, a lot of um, priests and roshis, et cetera, and yogis would come through and they'd be there. And uh, several times there were some very fine, fine in that better sense of the word, you know, very profound Buddhist um, roshis. And we had translators and would sit around and have tea and talk to them. And um, Alan asked the, I forget who it was, a bishop, it was a, I should remember his name, but I don't at the moment. He said, do you think Zen can ever be exported to the United States? Now, this is before there were any temples in L.A. or in California. Uh, and the, the Roshi said, no, he said, I, I don't think Zen is not, not exportable. Zen is a Japanese, Zen is Japanese. It was designed to meet a Japanese character, and, and it can't be exported. So... Um, Later, you know, when I've, when I've attended sessions here and there, uh, I find that the, the sessions that are most successful, uh, like my Zoomies and, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Suzaki, uh, are, they, what they do is they rebuild Japanese culture in the temple. And in that sense, then, they're replanting Japanese culture to make it work. And I think that's what makes it work. I don't know whether there have been too many Zen centers that have been successful that operated on non-Japanese lines, but that's probably because of my own ignorance, but uh, I don't know that. Capelo had one in Rochester, New York for a while, but then he went to Arizona. So in that sense, I think Alan was right. You know, he, he spotted it early. He said, hey, I don't think that's exportable. And they said, no, it's not exportable. They agreed. But uh, later, they started different Zen centers, which tried to incorporate a lot of Japanese customs. And so it somehow fit, gave it a way of expressing itself. You know, how can he do the Cho and Yai uh, tea ceremony w with plastic cups? <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it's, not going to, it's not going to make it, right? Oh, perfect, right. Can I help you in any way, any other question? Is that what you meant by enemies? Uh, Pardon me? Is that what you meant by enemies, people in competing spiritual groups? Oh, I was just using that playfully. Uh, I have heard a lot of criticism of him over the years because he's a this or a that or a this or a that. And, um, um, but you weren't talking in a political sense. Oh, no, not in a political sense. Oh, no, I don't think he had any political enemies. I, I, I don't know that part of his life. Didn't he have a habit of taking parts of different beliefs and philosophies and leaving the rest behind? Did, could you do that again? Did he have a habit of taking bits and pieces of uh, different religions and philosophies? And oh, saying, sure. These, oh. these are what I believe in. Yeah. These are where my tinker turned, where all connected, leaving the rest behind. And the people who are believe devoutly oh, in those. Oh philosophies and religions get very upset that he's left pieces that they consider oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. important mm -hmm. and intrinsic to that belief yeah. and ignore them. And yeah. that's, that's one thing that people get upset about. Yeah, yeah I, could, I could understand that. I've been accused of that myself. <laughs> yeah, it, because there is something about doing this, you see. If you, Plato calls a synoptic, a synoptic vision. If you have a synoptic vision where you want to see the kinships, you're not going to go for the differences too much. A certain class of differences you're not going to maintain. He, he, is, not, 
He is not any one of these in that sense that he could stand as an authority for each and every one. No, he's not. But uses them. In, in, and in that sense, he's always criticizable, isn't he? Yeah. yeah. But I think what he did with it, and I think he brought many people into this game, gave them a way of talking about it, made it conversational, that's a great achievement. The game. I call this the game, the great oh. game. Sometimes I call it the noblest game. Oh, the noblest game. Yeah. Plato calls playing. He says, you know, when you play, he said the noblest game is really consecration to the divine. Because... <laughs> no, 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 no. no. Uh, he, actually, he got this from um, uh, Jan Huizinga. Um, he says, look, when you think of a game, Again, what is so significant about a game is that we're willing to abide by law and rules. And we want fairness, and we want courage displayed, and we want integrity. We want all of the virtues, but it has to have a boundary. And he said, the real problem in life, therefore, is to play in such a way that you have no boundaries, and you're going to be that way in the great game, the noblest game, which is philosophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how would you define uh, the dialectic? Um, searching for your own ignorance. <laughs> you know, By means of a particular method which involves oh, yes. comparisons oh, yes. or... Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say Plato in incorporates the great method. And uh, the highest expression it is in the dialogue, the Parmenides, though it shows itself in the Republic and other dialogues. <laughs> what makes the dialectic different from other methods of getting, getting at the truth then? <coughs> Well, of course, that's a good question, but um, I think there's, I think any time thought seeks to rigorously try to discover the roots of one's thought fairly, right, and then examine why they're being held, and to try to find a way in which a person can be shown that these beliefs need not be entertained, since they are fictions, that is a dialectic. And that's in the Mino or any dialogue. Can you, can you just run through that again? That was very. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe I'll try to. You correct me. When thought tries to see itself or get a handle on its own roots, and see, I've forgotten it already. And then yeah. It, well, we'll create another one. <laughs> well, he has definite rules that he follows, and the Socratic reasoning to put him backwards to get you. If this is so, then what if, and then what if that, and then what if that, and you take it all those down, you're left with the, you are here, mm -hmm. sort of. But how do, you, how do you show that it's not true? You said it, when thought kind of reflects on itself and then it sees that there's a certain invalidity to something or other? I mean, Whenever a person sees that the grounds for believing what they believe are inadequate, they drop it. And on the highest level, you know, uh, the reason why dialectic is so uh, pure is because ultimately you can't have a belief or an image of the self. They're all fictions because uh, no name can be put upon the self. And any belief about it is going to be inadequate. That's not true. My mom called me Kevin when I was born. Well, I was glad to hear that. Yeah, so, I mean... Kevin's name myself. Is, yes, but were you Kevin pardon. before that? Yeah, I've been Kevin all my life. No, pardon, were pardon. you Kevin before you were Dave? I have to answer the question. No, I wasn't Kevin before that. Who were you? you? I was a soul in another body. No, so if you stay with his question, literally, mm -hmm. it's quite interesting. What would you call yourself before they named you? Even if it was only an hour, well, well, or a minute, realized. or a second. Yeah, that's a very profound question, isn't it? Like, what was your name before you were born? Or what no, was no, 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 not before. Before your parents were born. No, pardon me. Okay, just hold up. All right. The question that was asked was a good one. So, do you want to call yourself Kevin? But there was a time you existed before you got the name, even if it was only for a second. 
then what will you say you are at that time or were? I don't know. Good. Good. I acknowledge your own ignorance. This is the first step to knowledge. I've heard that before. Somewhere. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.